Thank you, Divya. A very good evening, all of you. Anti-fragility is property of a system which allows it to absorb the stress and gain from it. Anything which has more upside than downside can be called as anti-fragile. And innovation in that particular sense is all about having more upside than downside. And hence for us, innovation is the pathway to anti-fragility. The question then of course is how do we do it? A very good evening to all of you. I'm Adit Danak, principal at Zeno. And today I'll be sharing with you a perspective in terms of how we could think about unlocking innovation. Now, you would agree with me that in order for us to get the right answers, it is important to ask the right questions. It's almost a prerequisite. Uh, Google tells us that we are not alone. Whether it's Plato, it's Einstein, it's Peter Drucker, or Thomas Watson, a list of illustrious people agree on the same thing. Right questions lead to the right answers. The first question which comes to our mind is the distinction between invention and innovation. Is there a distinction? Well, yes. You see, invention is about creating a new product, a process, or a solution for the very first time. Whereas innovation is about turning a new or an existing solution, product, or a process into something practical, affordable, and reliable that customers would want to use. And I cannot emphasize more on this, is something that customers would want to use. Take, for example, Steve Jobs. He's known as a great innovator. A lot of technologies which have been used in iPod and iPhone in the first generation existed before the product. What Steve Jobs and the team at Apple managed to do is they managed to take all these technologies, convert them into a product, which you and I spend almost a month's salary to buy and own. And what that does is that allows them to convert a dollar into two, a two dollars into four, and consequently grow the company. And this is the question we ask a lot of leaders. We said, is innovation important to you? And 84% executives agreed that innovation was central to the growth strategy. At the same time, 94% executives reported that they were not happy with the innovation outcome. And for us, this was the part which had to be really asked, that why is this? Why is that innovation is important to us? At the same time, we are dissatisfied with the outcome. Now, on one hand, it could be about the distinction between invention and innovation where we talk about innovation, but we focus more on invention. But then 94% is too huge a number for that to be the only reason. And we wanted to dig a bit more. With the COVID-19 crisis happening, what we realized is that our operating conditions had completely changed. And suddenly we were in a situation where we had a new operating model, a new operating environment. We had two cases, pre-COVID, during COVID, and soon post-COVID. And these three scenarios allowed us to look at what has happened, what is happening, to figure out some common theme which allows us to tag this conundrum of what innovation really is. Now, to begin with, if you look at all the COVID-19 responses, and especially the effective responses, you would see four key elements. You would see the element of policy. Now, this is not just at a government level. This is not just at an organization level. This is not just at an institution level. It's also about societies. It's also about families in terms of how we go about things. Similarly, the use of technology. For the first time, we have had our disposal technologies available at scale, which can be deployed remotely from India to US, from US to India, which allows us to solve problems across the world. Now, because the operating conditions have changed, there is a whole element of innovation because how we did things may not be applicable anymore. I need to relook at those particular pieces. And then, of course, there's that element of entrepreneurship. The self-driven, the self motivated spirit of an individual which says never say die, rallies the team and tries to figure out a solution. Let's look at a few of the examples which are there. Now, one of the greatest things we have seen right now is a massive talent mobilization. If we take India alone, and if we only talk about R&D centers of global MNCs, there are close to about a million people working from home today. All of this happened in a span of four to eight weeks without losing productivity. 93% leaders have said that there has been no loss in productivity. If we look at a global scale, we are talking about almost 400 million people working from home right now, all white collar jobs. But this was not limited only to white collar. This is also applicable in case of factories. We have had companies like Britannia, Unilever, Amul, changing their operating protocols and modes to ensure that the factories are operational and our daily essential needs are met. Just imagine the complexity of a company like Amul, which already has a distributed supply chain with more than a million farmers providing milk. How do you maintain social distancing? How do you ensure quality of the good is coming in and the butter and the cheese that we are consuming is actually safe, right? 
And this is just one of the examples. We saw rapid digitalization. We, of course, had the C-suite working here. Only difference was instead of CXO, a CEO or a CTO, it was COVID-19, which made that whole material difference. Companies like Walmart have had to relook at the complete supply chain redesign because they had to solve for contactless experience. They had to solve for supply in a scenario where your inbound or outbound shipments could be stuck because the next city or the state or the country could be in lockdown. And then, of course, there is this whole element of being able to service the needs of the customers. We have similar examples from India. A good example is Apollo Health. Healthcare is not just about solving COVID-19 challenges. It's also about servicing the needs of people who had a health problem beyond COVID-19 as well. And Apollo has been investing heavily in terms of digitalizing the patient journey. Right from consultations to diagnostics to online pharmacies, Apollo is trying to move a fair bit of the patient journey online. We heard yesterday Amit Patnas, CD of GE Healthcare, talk about how 75% to 80% of the patient journey in healthcare can go digital very soon. Now, the examples which we are talking about are also in, in terms of collaboration and in terms of redeployment of capabilities. An interesting example in Indian context is of ACT grants. We saw multiple venture capitalists, philanthropic organizations, and private equity firms come together to create a 100 pro fund to be available to entrepreneurs and to professionals in larger companies or to individuals also to fight COVID-19 related challenges. We have seen 46 companies being supported through this initiative to grant money which is there and the impact has been humongous. Not only are they able to give capital, but they are also providing the expertise and the network to be able to deploy these solutions. Close to 10% of the PP requirement in India today is being serviced by companies because of ad grants, and this includes fashion platforms. We have platforms which were focused on distributed manufacturing, now taking that capability, shifting it from EPC services into building solutions for healthcare. A very interesting example is of Arvind Mills. Traditional company in fashion wear decided to use the supply chain network and the manufacturing capability to get into production of N95 masks. Very soon, Irwin Mills, someone which makes shirts and all, will be manufacturing close to 150 to 200,000 units of N95 on a daily basis. By mid of 2021, India will be self sufficient to up to 40% of its N95 requirement. And this is again just one of the examples. We saw beautiful collaborations happen. Uh, a great example is of Serum Institute, which invested in a company called MyLabs to be able to accelerate the production of the testing kits. They are right now producing 2 million units on a weekly basis. It's one of the key reasons why we in India are able to deploy these kits, are able to figure out if and how the virus is spreading. The interesting part here, however, is also of MyLabs, a company which end up creating a reliable and affordable solution which people wanted to use in terms of testing the, testing the cases. And then, of course, we have these examples of enormous building solution in education, in healthcare, in delivery services, in food tech, in retail, in grocery, without whose presence, it can be argued that our existence during this lockdown would have been a lot more difficult. Um, imagine trying to figure out your groceries if you're in Bangalore. Imagine, you know, the whole concern you would have in terms of paying cash every time you go to the grocery store. A lot of that has happened is because of the spirit of people to figure out a solution which would work for us. Now, when you look at all these solutions, and these are just examples, there is a very particular pattern. What we found is that survival was of paramount importance. Survival and focus on today and tomorrow made sure that we were not encumbered by our past. We were not encumbered by how the things were done or how they should be done. And consequently, individuals and teams had the freedom to be able to focus on a problem and to build out a solution and more critically, iterate on that particular solution. Freedom. Think about every scenario when you wanted to do a project. Think about scenarios when you wanted to think of that wonderful startup idea that you have had and on odds are you would have said, if only, I had the freedom to do this. If only I was not encumbered with ABC things. And you would know and you would believe that you would be able to do it, which is true. And as Matt Riley beautifully puts out, is that innovation is a child of freedom because it is a create free and creative attempt to satisfy freely expressed human desires. Innovation and freedom go hand in hand. There are a lot of unknowns that you have to figure out as you go about building out a solution that customers will use. 
There are a lot of variables and you need the flexibility to go around and figure out how to really achieve that. But when you think of freedom, you also think about risks. Let's rewind a bit. Think of your conversation with your parents when you were a teenager. If you have kids, think of the conversations you're having now. Think of the debate we have about society and individual. It's always a debate about freedom. And as soon as we talk about freedom, it's about risks, which is fair. You don't want to give freedom and lose the company, right? But before we start solving for freedom and we start thinking about risk, there are certain boundary conditions we would want to share with you. The first part is that when it comes to innovation, and since we're talking about something that customers would use, it could come in any shape and form. It could come in form of new customers, new markets, new segments, new products, or it could be about improving what you already have. It could be about improving your customer support systems. It could be about improving your value chain. Point being that innovation will not always be breakthrough. It can be incremental, but it'll keep your company, your growth strategy plans going forward. The other aspect, of course, is that these ideas and this capability of execution will not decide with a single team, and they can come from anywhere in the company. And consequently, you want to focus on the breadth of things. You want to make it easy and possible for you to be able to access these ideas and be able to act on them, regardless of the person being in different position in the company or even being outside the company. And the core part that you're trying to do with risk resolution is that you want to ensure that these teams, as they are building out the product, have access to right resources, the right capabilities, which improves their odds of success as they're going forward. Now, the best thing that we have seen so far is that it's impossible to solve for everything overnight. Do remember that you're talking about innovation, you're talking about a lot of variability, you're talking about a lot of unknowns. And in that sense, what we have found to be extremely effective is to look at innovation as a journey. There are different stages, and these are the stages that we want to solve at a time. A good example would be of a student. We go to kindergarten, we go to primary, we go to secondary, higher secondary, from there to college, to post-graduation. If you see in the system, they're not trying to solve for every single thing right from the word go. It's all about saying that, okay, can we make you better today so that you're better prepared for tomorrow? You're leaving the options open. At the same time, you're making some fundamental capabilities into that particular individual. And think of doing something similar with that idea that you want to work on, with that solution that you want to work on. Break down the whole journey, right from the ideation to its growth and scale, and we start to figure out what are the risks we need to solve today, what we can control without adding too many bureaucratic elements into the process. The reason this is important is because when it comes to solving for risk, there is no silver bullet. It depends a lot in terms of what your current status is, where you want to get to, what kind of timeline you're looking at, and of course, what kind of resources you have available. Importantly, we want to do this not as a short-term thing, but as a capability, as a muscle for the organization, and that requires a holistic approach. It requires us to think strategically in terms of what our vision is. It requires us to think of organization and culture in terms of how do we think about innovation and how do we act on it. Remember, culture is not what we talk, it's about what we do. So how do you bring that into the organization? It's about innovation lifecycle process. How is it that it's designed currently and how is it that it should be designed currently? You could be in hardware, you could be in software, you could be in embedded systems, you could be in an extremely regulated industry. You need to figure out what does that life cycle process look like for the organization. Then of course, there is the element of enabling factors. There is a very definite and very strong role of procurement of IT, HR, finance, facilities, admin, uh, I would say even transportation, in terms of enabling people to be able to innovate freely. You are constantly trying to give them the freedom, and there are a lot of these smaller pieces, critical, important pieces that need to be solved for. Lastly, but most importantly, is about success. In any organization, when we talk about culture, one thing which we have found to be rather missing is in terms of how do we define success and how do we talk about success? This is beyond rewards and incentives. It's about something very, very real. Because success is what will drive a lot of people to push themselves and to push forward. And you want to make it achievable. You want to make it feasible. When you look at this particular slide, I would request you not to look at this as a pyramid, as a three-dimensional physical object, because that would mean you have to start at the bottom. But rather look at this as a canvas. Look at what is it that you're trying to deal with today, and then figure out which part of this particular canvas you want to focus on and you want to color. Odds are that will allow you to take an action. Odds are it would allow you to go forward. Given the fact 
that the solutions and the approaches would be very different for each one of you. It's definitely different for me compared to any other consulting organization as I think about my role in Zeno and how to grow the business. And that's why I wouldn't want to leave you with any five points or seven points of takeaways, but only this one request is that we ask the right questions. What does innovation mean to you? What does innovation mean to your organization? What does freedom mean? How do you think about risk? How do you proactively identify and mitigate these particular risks? And how do you create a virtuous flywheel based on success, which just allows you to grow and be more stronger as we go forward? These are not easy questions. And what I'm hoping is that today's sessions and in, 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 in days to come, you would be able to think about these questions and find answers that are relevant for you. As you think of these answers, do let us know. We would be happy to talk to you. But it's definitely a subject of interest in terms of answering a simple question that if innovation is so important to us, why are we still dissatisfied? And we need to build from there in terms of asking the right questions. With that, good day, good evening, and thank you so much.